fewer have solid grounding in the history of philosophy, and it's rare for someone to have both, and extremely rare for someone to seriously work both into their research. That's what Maria has done, and she can do. This makes his work both unusual and valuable from a number of different angles. He's able to draw upon the insights of Kant to formulate distinctive positions about the relation between cognition and perception, as well as what it is for an experience to represent the content as objective. And he's also able to draw upon contemporary work in cognitive science to suggest readings of Kant that may have extra plausibility and palatability. Um, what else do I want to say? So he focuses on a variety of issues connected with perception, some of which I've been talking about tonight. Um, what are the contents of perceptual states? What's the metaphysical nature of perception? does it involve? Is there a relation between perceivers and ordinary objects? Representation, sense data. How do our perceptual states justify our beliefs about the world? And so on. Part of what makes the study of perception exciting and philosophically fertile in Farid's hands is that it serves as a central node connecting a variety of different philosophical fields. Um, and he draws upon them all with Reed also, as some of you may know, is a Renaissance man. Uh, before becoming a philosopher, he received his uh, MD in Tehran and worked as a medical doctor. So, if anything happens, it'll probably be that. <laughs> um, um, he excels also in woodworking. Um, we can ask about that in the Q&A. And uh, uh, Elliot Soper recently told me that he is also quite good indeed at ping pong. I'm very happy to introduce Marie um, to tell us about Dancing with the World, how perceptual experience connects us with the environment. Well, thanks, uh, Alan, for the very nice, generous <laughs> introduction. Uh, and uh, thanks the philosophy department for giving me the opportunity to present uh, some of my ideas here tonight. And thank you uh, for coming. Uh, it's a cold uh, start of the winter night, and uh, it's much appreciated that uh, you have come. So uh, today uh, I'm I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, the metaphysical nature of perceptual experience, basically, and. Uh, so what I mean by perceptual experience is the ordinary experiences that we have uh, that connect us intuitively, in a sense, to the world. When you wake up, you open your eyes, you see the world around you, you look out the window, you see the snow on the ground, maybe you hear the birds, maybe you smell the coffee. These are all perceptual experiences that inhabit our lives as we uh, open our eyes. And in a sense, perceptual experience is the window, the locus where uh, the world is given to us. Our knowledge uh, of the world, uh, to a great extent, depends on perceptual experience. Uh, for example, right now, you know that you're in your room uh, with other people because you see them. You have visual experiences of them. And our ability to think about the world, even when we are not perceiving it, uh, uh, intuitively depends on our ability to perceive the world. So. Philosophers have been trying to uh, understand how perceptual experience does its job of connecting us with the world. And the talk today is about this issue. Uh, how should we understand perceptual experience? What is the nature of the perceptual experience in such a manner that makes sense us, enables us to make sense of how perceptual experience does its connecting job well? So what I'm going to do is to uh, start by talking about three philosophical outlooks uh, that I will introduce by certain metaphors and uh, uh, kind of structure the talk uh, with those. So uh, one way uh, of thinking about perceptual experience is like thinking of it as creating some sort of realistic painting of the world around you. So your perceptual system or your mind, if you like, when we perceive the world, is like a painter, a realistic painter. 
uh, who obtains information about the world and uses that to create some sort of model, a stand-in or a surrogate uh, for what is out there in the world, where that surrogate or model or what you might call the representation is in the mind or in your head. That's one way to think about perception. There is also a realist way of thinking about perception. One a specific brand of realism that I'm going to use as the case here, as, uh, as the central case, sees our uh, default state, where we are before perceiving the world, as something like being confined in a room, uh, for example, behind walls. You need to break through, you need to bust through these walls, create openings in them for the world to show up. That's kind of the realist intuition. So it is not, perception is not a matter of creating some sort of representation in your head on the realist intuition. Perception is a matter of busting out, creating openings uh, in the kind of barrier that exists between the mind and the world. Uh, a third way of thinking about perception is what I call constructivism. Uh, on that view, to perceive the world is to kind of, in some sense, resonate with it in the same sense that a dancer creates the dance to uh, resonate or to adjust its movement with its partners. Of course, these are uh, metaphorical ways of speaking. I'm going to talk through them uh, in more detail to kind of uh, um, open up these metaphors for being more understandable. And uh, so the plan is going to be, I'll start uh, with internalist representationalism. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, more about it. But then I'm going to uh, raise a problem for it uh, that is supposed to uh, show that this view, in some important cell, fails to accommodate the intuition that perceptual experience is uh, the locus of connection between us and the world. Then I'm going to talk about realism, and I'm going to raise two objections to realism. And this kind of builds up uh, uh, a set of problems that I'm going to put together and explain why it's a little bit challenging to uh, solve these problems. And uh, so the problem of understanding perceptual experience is going to be a little bit of a difficult problem given the set of kind of pressures, theoretical pressures that we have to kind of accommodate when we theorize philosophically about perceptual experience. And then I'm going to argue that the constructivist actually is one of the views that can do a good job at handling these problems. Uh, so let me start with the internalist representationalist view. OK. So on this view, when we perceive the world, uh, when we open our eyes, that enables some sort of causal uh, impact that the world has on our mind. So when you look at an object, a strawberry. Uh, light reflects on, this, uh, on the surface of this object. It uh, creates an activity on your retina that is propagated by an optic nerve to some part of your brain. Ultimately, when all the work is done, that gives rise to a representation, a stand-in in in your brain of the external object. It's supposed to be that. Uh, small uh, picture, this is supposed to be a representation. This is kind of uh, the rough intuition of the internalist representationalist. To be a little bit more specific, the internalist representation kind of combines two theses or two ideas with uh, each other. One is that uh, to perceive is to form an internal representation. By saying that this representation is internal and it's a representation, one thing that I want to emphasize is that on this view, perceptual experience is something whose existence is independent from what it represents. So after the strawberry has done its job and caused a representation in you, if you take away the strawberry, that representation may persist because it's a different thing whose existence is only causally related to the strawberry in the outside world. In fact, it could be that, you know, on some views, you can have the same perceptual experience even, even without an external cause, for example, when you're hallucinating. Uh, and so this is a consequence of the idea that to perceive is to form uh, an internal representation. Another uh, 
thesis that usually goes with uh, internalist representationalism, uh, representationalism is what you might call qualitative internalism. To tell you what that is, uh, I should say a little bit about what I mean by qualitative properties. So when we perceive, the, when we have perceptual experiences, when we perceive the world, it is not just that we gain information about the world. Having perceptual experience involves being in a state or having uh, being in a state where you can say about it that there is something like to be in that state. When you hear the song of the birds, there is something that it is like hearing the song. When you smell uh, the smell of coffee, there is something that it is like smelling the coffee, or when you taste the coffee, or when you see the strawberry, there is something that it is like having the experience of something that is red. These features of experience uh, sometimes by philosophers are called it's phenomenal character or it's qualitative character. You can think of experience having a qualitative character as experience confronting you or acquainting you with some qualitative properties. Now, how does this relate to internalism? A lot of internalists, and I'm going to take this as to be a typical for their views, are qualitative internalists. They, a lot of them, think that when you look at the strawberry, the qualitative redness, not the physical redness that is a property of the surface, a physical properties of the surface of, uh, of the strawberry that gives it the disposition to reflect light in such and such a way that creates a specific pattern of activity in your brain. Not the physical property, but the qualitative redness is not in the strawberry. That is a feature of your experience. It is a property of your internal representation. The taste of the coffee is a feature of your internal representation. Uh, and so about all qu other qualitative properties. OK, so there is a lot more to say about internalist representationalism. It is a view that has many advocates. It's one of the central views in actually the science of perception. Uh, and it sits well within a broader context of research that supports this. A lot of theories of how perceptual experience work are uh, written and explained in terms of manipulations of representations and computations over representations that give rise to represent. It's a very central view in contemporary science of perception. A lot of philosophers also find it attractive. It has a lot of other theses. But the two that are interesting, for, uh, important for our talk are the two that I just explained. Uh, and I'm going to say that these two, especially the internal representationalist picture, creates some difficulty in accommodating the intuition that perceptual experience is, does a very special role in connecting us with the world. And that's what I'm going to try to explain uh, now. So, one implication of internalist representationalism is that perceptual evidence, the evidence that it gives you, right now I have evidence that I'm in this room with a lot of people around me. Perceptual evidence is probabilistic evidence because you have perceptual evidence in virtue of having perceptual experience. And perceptual experience is a matter of a representation inside you. The relationship between that representation and what it represents, it's probabilistic. As I said, one reason for that is that a representation can exist independent of what it represents. The existence of the representation in you does not guarantee the existence of its object. The relationship is always probabilistic. Uh, but I think uh, one could make a case for uh, the claim that perceptual Evidence is not probabilistic. It's not like polling evidence. If perceptual experience evidence is probabilistic, perceptual evidence is like polling evidence. The evidence that you get do acquire when you do some sort of polling, for example, opinion surveys. Uh, but perceptual evidence is not polling evidence. Uh, this thought is, uh, you know, requires uh, uh, if you give it in the context of, you know. A philosophy talk, it requires a lot of defense. But I'm going to just try to convey the simple intuition that is behind it. And uh, 
to do so, let's first uh, talk about one feature of polling evidence that I uh, want to argue perceptual evidence does not have. That feature is this. Um, you know, talking about the, actually the recent contemporary context helps uh, bring out that feature. During the past few elections, maybe not the last one that we have just had, uh, there has been uh, uh, an obs the observation that uh, opinion surveys underrepresented certain political group. For example, the uh, Republican support uh, for uh, the Republican presidential candidates. Uh, so in 2016, for example, opinion polls predicted that uh, uh, Hillary Clinton will defeat Donald Trump. That doesn't hap didn't happen, as all of you know. Uh, in 2018, they, represent, uh, they predicted an outcome that was much better for Democrats than it uh, actually happened. And even in 2020, although uh, the polls predicted that Biden, President Biden will uh, defeat Trump, but still, the numbers that actually we got at the end was very different. We're very different from the numbers. The difference, the, you know, uh, between the uh, between the two candidates was much less than what the polls predicted. This created some sort of a skepticism uh, among the public about opinion polling. And you might know that some of the people who are in that business have been trying to kind of. Uh, 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 you know, address that as skepticism. One of them who uh, was uh, uh, the journalist in resident, uh, residence in actually at, at UW this semester, Nate Silver, even wrote a book about it. Nate Silver, uh, in uh, among many things that he has done to try to kind of address this as skepticism, he has been emphasizing one simple fact about polling evidence. The simple fact is that even if you do everything right, even if you get your samples in the right way, uh, your samples are not biased, you observe your samples in the right way, you get right information from your samples, and you all do all the math right, still pro polling evidence is probabilistic evidence. There is a still, even at the best case scenario, let's say you have 99% confidence in the result that you got, there is 1% likelihood that your prediction might turn out to be wrong. So here is an important feature of polling evidence. Even if you do it right, you might get it wrong. And that's a general feature of every sort of probabilistic evidence. Okay. Now I want to kind of prompt the intuition that there is a sense in which perceptual experience is not like this. And to do that, we need to do a, a, do a game. So I brought this box, it's just not advertising, but this brand of shoes. There is something in this box. I want you to guess what it is that is in this box. You can ask me questions, you know. I won't tell you what is exactly, but you want, does someone want to start with questions? Here's how it sounds. What is inside the box? It is just one object. Turn the box the other way. Yes. Is it made of wood? Very good question. It's made of something that comes from wood. <laughs> is it something you've made from something you touch? No. <laughs> yes. Another cardboard box? No, but you're, <laughs> you're getting a little close. Yeah? I haven't tried it. I, <laughs> I should, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> it kind of bends. It's not super solid. Yeah? Could you speak loud? Is it? No, it's not a cork. It's not cork. I'll show you what it is. You know, otherwise we will never finish the talk. It's a it's a small book on mindfulness. Uh, it's made of paper. Uh, yeah. Well, now here is what I want. How this relates to that talk? 
Uh, here's how it relates. We were playing uh, what you might call an a game of inquiry. You could have, you know, we could have continued asking questions, and you know, maybe eventually you would have increased uh, the credence that you associate with some beliefs about what this is, right? You were acquiring evidence about what this is, probabilistic evidence. But when I showed you this book, our game ended. Our game ended. Uh, why is that? Uh, why did your perceptual experience of the book end our game of inquiry? You might ask yourself. And this is not just a feature of this game. It's a feature of everyday life. You know, maybe some new family moved into your neighborhood. You're wondering if they have a child. Uh, you haven't met them yet. You walk by their house. You see, oh, there is a small tricycle in the yard. That gives you some evidence. Maybe they have a child. You raise your credence in that belief. One day you hear a child crying. That sound comes out of the house. You raise your credence. You continue. Maybe you acquire a lot of information. You haven't met them. You increase the likelihood that they have a child. But when you see, finally meet the family and their child, your game ends. Why is that? Why does perceptual experience finish your epistemic projects? Now, here is, uh, we can go over various explanations for, uh, for this, for why perceptual experience plays that role. You know, maybe it passes a threshold, maybe it gives you certainty, uh, but I don't think any of those explanations ultimately is gonna work. And I would be happy to talk about why during the Q&A. But I think the explanation that does work is that actually perceptual evidence is subject to a different norm. If you do it right, you get it right, unlike polling. So if you are really having a perceptual experience, not an illusion, not a hallucination, if you're doing it right, perceptual experience guarantees that you're gonna get it right. And in that respect, it's very different from polling. polling and other forms of inductive evidence, if you do all your epistemic duties, every, you know, whatever uh, operation, mathematical, logical, that you have to perform, if you do them right, if it's inductive evidence, there's always gonna be a gap between your evidence and the facts that uh, it tells you obtains in the world. But the best explanation for why perceptual experience has this specific place in our domain of inquiry, it finishes the job, is that it is subject to a different role. And that's if you do it right, you get it right. And because we work with the default assumptions, and you, you know, you, right now you're here, none of you, I guess, assumes that you are dreaming or hallucinating or you know, having a grand illusion. Uh, you work with the default assumption that you're doing it right. Your perceptual system is doing it right. And that's why, this puts an end to your epistemic inquiry. So we worked with that default assumption, and perceptual evidence is subject to that role. Therefore, that's why it plays this specific uh, role in our inquiries. As I said, there is a lot more that one can say about this, but I'm gonna uh, just uh, confine myself to this point. So one problem for internalist representationalism is that Internalist representationalism implies that perceptual evidence is like polling evidence, but perceptual evidence is not like polling evidence. Okay, so this is the only problem uh, that I wanted to raise for this kind of view. Let's move on to realism. As I said, on the realist picture, in the pre-perceptual space, the mind is kind of stuck in some sort of uh, prison, and it needs to break out. That's what perception does. Perception uh, helps us bust out of that epistemic position. Uh, the realist says, and here I'm representing the position of a direct realist, not all types of realists would say that, that when you open your eyes, you're not forming a representation. Opening your eyes is not a matter of forming the representation. The realist says everything else that happens after that in your brain, all those fancy perceptual processes that the scientists want 
to understand and study and have been helping us understand. And understand. These are just more eyes that you open. They are not representations. These are more eyes that you open. In order to perceive that a strawberry, you have to open your eyes to its shape. You have to open your eyes to its color. You have to open your eyes to the fact that the shape and color are in some sense unified with each other. After all of that is done, you perceive the strawberry, not because you have formed a representation in your head, but because you have a relation of direct awareness, direct sensory awareness to the strawberry. This is a view that is sometimes called direct realism, sometimes called naive realism, uh, and it combines these two theses. One of them is the direct awareness thesis. Uh, perceptual experience consists in a direct awareness of the external objects in the environment around us. The emphasis on direct here is that there is no surrogate here. If there is nothing there, you will not have perceptual experience. Because direct awareness is a form of awareness that requires the existence of its object, as opposed to representational awareness. The other thesis of this view is qualitative externalism. As I said, in the internal, for the internal representationalist, the redness, the taste of the coffee, the redness of the strawberry, the blue of the ocean, all of these are the qualitative aspects of them in your head. For the, real, for the realist, these are actually mind-independent qualities of objects. The redness is in the strawberry. The blueness is in the ocean. The smell of the coffee is in the coffee. These are mind-independent properties of objects around us. One thing that is attractive about this view is that it does not have that problem that we just talked about, about internalist representationalism. It does not, on this view, it does not follow that perceptual evidence is like polling evidence. Because perceptual experience, in a sense, has the world as a component, as a part, because it's a direct relation to the world. Now, I am used direct realism to present this view uh, as a one very uh, uh, central type of a realist view. A realist view doesn't have to be a direct realist view. There is another view, actually, that uh, was born in our uh, university <laughs> here in the philosophy department called externalist representationalism that is also realist in some important sense. Uh, but that view, I, you know, although it has a lot of advocates and it has been very influential, that is a view that I find it hard actually to convey in an intuitive way. So I didn't use that as an example. Uh, these two brands of realism, direct realism and externalist uh, representationalism or externalist realism, uh, sorry, uh, representational realism, they have attracted different types of criticism. Some of these criticisms are directed at one of the specific view. So, uh, so for example, uh, a lot of people are suspicious about direct realist views because of the possibility of having hallucinations and illusions and experiences of things that are not out there, or they think the view does not sit well with the science of perception. That's a discussion that we can have. I I think actually a lot of these objections ultimately are not successful. But I want to focus on two problems that affect both direct realism and other versions of realism, specifically externalist representationalism. And here are two problems that I think these realist views give rise to. One of them is, uh, I'm going to call it mind dependence problem. Uh, to put it uh, succinctly, it is hard to see how qualitative features could be mind independent. And I'll say, I'm going to say why that is. And then the other one is multiplicity. Realism implies that there is one way to correctly perceive a property, an external property. But there is evidence to the contrary. There is empirical evidence to the contrary. So uh, what is the mind independence problem? I recently uh, learned, to my delight, that there is a mulberry tree in our yard growing. It's very young, and I have been thinking that it is just the grass, so I have been cutting it. But one day, finally, someone, someone told me this is a mulberry tree. And I love mulberry trees, so I have started imagining, you know, five years down the line, we're going to have something like this. 
uh, in our yard. I really excited. I love marbles. Uh, okay. So there is this mulberry tree in our uh, yard, let's imagine. And I think, you know, this is an example, a paradigm case of a mind independent pack. The location of the tree is something that does not depend on what I experience, what I believe. It's a mind independent fact. That tree is in the yard, right? Being such a fact, this location of the tree enters into many explanatory projects. It explains why I visually experience the tree when I look at that location of the yard. It explains why at some point during the day there is shade in that location of the yard. That location being close to the driveway, it explains why the concrete is cracking, you know, uh, that part I wasn't hoping, but I thought that I'll just use that. The, uh, the roots are making the concrete crack. It explained why the birds love our yard in the summer, all these fancy things that I'm imagining is going to happen. You know, the location of the tree would explain all of those. When something is mind independent, it participates and unifies explanations of many phenomena, especially mind independent phenomena. Okay, now here's the problem for realism because it, one of the theses of realism was that qualitative properties are mind independent properties of objects out there. It looks like qualitative properties only participate in explanation of one type of phenomenon and that is the character of per our perceptual experience. That's it. You know, the physical properties of the surface of the strawberry explain its causal role in creating some pattern of activation in my retina and all else. They explain a lot, but those are the physical qualities. The qualitative properties, the redness of the strawberry, only and only if we accept the realist view, it explains why my experience has the specific qualitative character that it has. Why is it that when I look at the strawberry, I have this reddish feeling because the strawberry is red and I am perceptually aware of it. That's the realist explanation. But that is a mind-dependent phenomenon. It's the quality of my experience that it is explained. There is nothing else that this property, this quality, figures in to explain. This should make us suspicious of the claim that this is a mind independent quality of the objects. At best, we don't really understand in some important sense of the term how that could be true. So it's very hard to see how the realists about qualitative properties, given their kind of causal impotence, uh, can kind of make a convincing case that these are mind independent properties of objects. Now this intensifies when you look at this problem. Another problem, there's a lot of empirical evidence that people do not perceive uh, qualitative properties in exactly the same way. You know, we have empirical evidence, for example, that color perception changes with age. Uh, some of my previous earlier work was about even, you know, the way in which uh, perception of spatial properties like shape and size, these kind of things, vary depending on which part of the visual field an object projects an image on. These all vary. And there are a lot of cases where there is difference in uh, the quality of perceptual experience that people are having. And you cannot say one of them is perceiving the world in, in, a, in a bad way. There is nothing wrong going on. So you have evidence that, for example, when people look at a strawberry, one of them has experience that is more like the one to the left, the other one has an experience uh, that is more like the one to the right. Which one of these is right? There is no criterion based on which we can answer that question. But the realist has to say either both of them are wrong or one of them is right. So there are cases where it looks like there is difference in the way we perceive the world and it looks like uh, we don't have a criterion to tell us which one is right. And the kind of one conclusion to draw here is that there are multiply different ways to perceive the world in some cases, perceive some qualitative properties. None of them is right. 
uh, more right than the other one. Uh, that is what I call multiplicity. There are extreme cases of this. You know, if, for example, if it was the case that our you know, color wheel was fully symmetric, then you could have you know, full spectrum inversions where uh, cases where when someone is looking at a strawberry, they're having the same exact type of experience that you have when you look at a cucumber. Your experiences would have been uh, spectral inverse of each other and there would have been no way to tell which one of you is perceiving the world correctly. But we don't need those ex extreme cases. There is empirical evidence that kind of like non-extreme cases of this happen. So this phenomenon, I call it multiplicity. If realism is correct, then there is one way to correctly experience qualitative properties, but there are multiple ways to correctly experience qualitative properties. That's the second problem for realism. Okay. So, let me take a stock. We have talked about three problems. One was the problem of perceptual knowledge. That's the problem that uh, it looks like perceptual experience uh, provides of the type of evidence, the perceptual evidence that is not probabilistic. Uh, and it looks like the internalist representationalist view cannot accommodate that data. There is also mind dependence. It looks like qualitative properties should be better understood as mind dependent properties. And there are the type of properties that can per be perceived in multiply different correct ways. And that does not sit well with realism as we just discussed. But the difficulty, the challenge is that these problems push us in these different directions. If you put experience in the head, as the representationalist does, you're going to have uh, a good, you know, an easy job accommodating mind dependence and multiplicity. But you're going to have trouble with explaining perceptual knowledge. If you put uh, uh, perceptual experience where the realist does it, outside, as having the, its main component be outside in the world, especially the quality properties, you're going to have a good time accommodating the role of perceptual experience in providing evidence for us, for support, you know, provide, furnishing us with knowledge, but you're going to have problems with mind dependence and multiplicity. So these problems push us in these different directions. And that's why one, that's one reason why uh, philosophical understanding of perceptual experience has been difficult. Okay, so to summarize, internalizing experience makes perceptual knowledge problematic externalizing it uh, creates tension with mind dependence and multiplicity. Okay, so now I want to uh, argue that the constructivist view help us solve this puzzle of figuring out how we can uh, have a view that uh, uh, satisfies all these kind of desiderata that we need to satisfy to have a, a good account of perceptual experience. Okay. Uh, so I'm saying on this view, perceiving is like dancing. Of course, this is again a metaphor. I just mean there are some analogies between perceiving and dancing. Specifically, I want to say that there are two features that dancing has that also perceiving, I'm going to try to convince you, also has. So the first feature is externality. Uh, when you dance with a partner, your dance is this thing it's a temporally extended, spatially extended, transient on item that exists only when you're dancing. And it includes your body, your partner, uh, and your mind. Your dance is also mind dependent. Whether you're dancing or not, and what kind of dance you're dancing, is not just a matter of how your body moves. If someone else is moving your body, you're not dancing. Uh, whether you're dancing or not depends on how this mode of resonance with the external world is linked to your agency. So dancing, whether you're dancing or not, is something that is a mind-dependent phenomenon. So dancing has these two features. And you can already see why this kind of might create a, a solution to the problem that we were trying to solve. If it is the case that perceptual experience is like dancing, then 
We have a third option. We don't need to put the quality redness in the red mind or in the object. We can say that that is a quality of your dance, uh, an entity that exists not in your mind, but it's an externalized entity partly because it includes your partner, it includes your body, but at the same time is mind dependent, okay? So this is the basic intuition of why this might uh, help us solve the problem. Uh, I'm gonna say a little bit more about it, but of course, the basic question is here is how could perceiving be like dancing, right? That, that's the big elephant in the room. So, uh, all right, now this was all introduction. The real work starts here. Uh, okay, so to, to understand how perceiving could be like dancing, uh, we, I think, we should start by trying to understand uh, the work of uh, an American perceptual psychologist, J.J. Gibson, some of you uh, probably know his work much better than I do. Uh, he was uh, uh, a very prominent figure in the 60s and 70s, uh, published a bunch of books. He was a professor at Cornell University, became a member of the uh, National Academy of Science. Uh, he was a big force in uh, the study of creating the discipline of perceptual psychology. Although, you know, that's, that's not when this was created, but it was, it was a big deal. But he had non-orthodox views about perceptual experience. He thought that perceiving is a matter, perception is a matter of a direct awareness of the environment. He had this idea that perceiving is direct. He was against the idea that perceiving involves representations or manipulations of representations. He was very influential in creating the movement that is these days called embodied cognition, but his views in perceptual science did not become orthodox. So I want to try to convey the insight that Gibson has, and I think that's the key to understanding why perceiving at least one kind of sort, type of perceiving that I will call core perception is like dancing. To see that, Let's just start with a very simple problem and see kind of how the brain solves this perceptual problem. One of the problems, very simple problems that a perceptual system solve is that they figure out, for example, the size of the objects. You know, you look at a tree at a distance, you want to figure out how tall that tree is, right? And a lot of the cues that you have uh, may not be enough. So, for example, think about that angle of sight that you have. Of course, the taller the tree, is the angle of sight will be bigger and the brain can have information about what the angle of sight is. But that under determines the size of the tree because a different tree that is much larger but is farther away will give you the same angle of sight. A lot of perceptual uh, problems that you, our perceptual systems solve involve the kind of solving these under determination problems because the information that we get from the world is not enough to kind of tell us what the layout of the environment is. Now you can solve that problem uh, in many different ways and there are many different ways that the brain solves the problem. One very simple way is to move. If you go forward, if you move towards the tree, the angle of sight changes and it is a simple matter of geometry to see that the angle of sight for the tree that is smaller and closer to you increases with a rate that is higher than the angle of sight for the tree that's farther away and top. Okay, now you can simply, the brain can simply use this, knowing, for example, the speed by which, relative speed by which it is moving, and the rate in which the angle of sight incre is increasing can solve that under determination problem. Uh, it's called that the computational solution. You know, the kind of approach that I called uh, uh, goes with internalist representationalism and is one of the central approaches in perceptual science is the kind of computationalist approach. Uh, these perceptual scientists see the brain as performing some computations over the value of representations that are obtained by getting information from the environment. So there is really a kind of on some versions of these views, there's this little mathematician in your mind that is computing these sophisticated mathematical functions to figure out solutions to easy problems. And Gibson was really against thinking about perception in this way. 
he thought that the same kind of idea that you know, movement gives you some sort of information that helps you solve that problem should actually push you in the direction of looking at the solution in a completely different way. How uh, should we look at the solution? Uh, think about it in this way. When you are looking at the tip of a tree while moving towards it, you have to increase your angle of sight. You do that by turning your eyes up or turning your neck up, right? Uh, if you want to keep your focus on the tip of the tree, which means in some other sense that if you want the image of the tree to be on your fovea, in your eyes, your eyes should keep up with your feet. If your eyes fall behind as you're moving towards uh, the tree, you will lose the image of the tree that was on a specific part of your retina. It'll be displaced. To keep it on that part, your eyes and your feet should coordinate. And the coordination pattern is different for a tree that is close to you than a tree that is farther away from you. Because the coordination pattern requires that when you are getting to an object that is closer to you, uh, like that is a smaller tree, you need to move your eyes faster in relation to your movement than when the object is farther away. This is a very simple thing that we do, again, in everyday life. Uh, you know, we focus on something as we are moving, moving towards it. But this requires actually a very sophisticated skill. Uh, your brain uh, need to figure out, to, need to uh, enact or use a routine that coordinates the motor signal that it sends to the muscles of your eyes that control how your eyes move uh, with the signal that it sends to the muscles of your legs that make you move. These need to be coordinated. Otherwise, you'll lose your focus. The image of the object will not stay where it is on the retina. Okay? So keeping the tip of the tree on the same location in your retina requires a coordination routine. And that coordination routine partly depends which coordination routine you're using depends on which situation you're in. If you're in this situation with the smaller tree closer to you, you use one coordination routine. If you're in a different uh, situation with the larger tree farther away, you use a different coordination routine. These are oculomotor coordination routines. So Gibson's idea was that, in a sense, to figure out what the size of the tree is in this situation is to figure out which oculomotor coordination routine enables you to engage in this type of activity the activity of, so successfully engage in this type of activity, the activity of maintaining your focus on the tip of the tree as you're moving towards it. So unlike the computationalist that says you have a little mathematician in your head that computes these functions, Gibsonian says you have a little engineer uh, who finds what is the right coordination routine that it needs to use. That's the way you figure out the size of the tree. You don't perform a computation over representations. And there is nothing in your head that acts like a surrogate. But how do you figure out how, which coordination routine is right? You figure it out by trial and error in the same way that this guy who's balancing the spoon on the tip of his nose figures out how to move in order to keep it balanced. Perceptual experience is a matter of balancing with the world the value of a, keeping the value of a parameter constant as you're moving in the world and changing your relationship with the world. That enables you to figure out what the world is in the same sense that it enables you to figure out the size of the tree. If you look at things in this way, then you can think of a perceptual process that requires constant contact with the world, that requires adjusting the routines that you're using on a continuous basis as a process that includes your body, you know, your sensory organs, uh, the muscles that make them move, the tree in the world. These are all part of one process that is extended into the environment 
has one foot in your brain, has one foot in the world. It's an extended, temporary, uh, uh, both um, especially and temporary extended process that in which your body and the world participate. When you start thinking about perception like this, then uh, a lot of problems that our perceptual systems solve start making a little bit more sense. So how does a receiver or a fielder figure out where they need to be? You know, the ball the, is coming from way farther away with a speed that is very hard to figure out, in a direction that is very hard to figure out. How do they figure out how fast they should run and in which direction to be at the right moment, at the right place to catch the ball? How do they figure this out? From a Gibsonian perspective, there is no representation of the environment and a computation over these very sophisticated mathematical functions that you need to perform to do this. Figuring that out is a matter of keeping your eyes focused on the ball and keeping the value of a parameter constant. So for example, if you run in the right direction with the right speed, you can keep the image of the ball fixed on your retina. That's how you solve this problem by acting in a world in such a way that keeps the value of a parameter constant. When you think about it this way, then a lot of things will start looking like perception. A basketball player who runs as they're dribbling is in some way figuring out how flat the ground is. They're also figuring out the degree to which the basketball is inflated. If the ground is not flat, they have to change the motor routine, the sensory motor routine that they are using in order to compensate for the non-flatness of the ground. And in that way, they're figuring out to what degree the ground is flat. So in a way, you know, thinking about perception in this way, it's not just uh, thinking about a solution to a problem that was, how do I create a function whose output is the degree of flatness of the environment? Perception is a matter of resonating with the environment. It's not a matter of finding out the correct representation of the value of a parameter in the environment. You figure it out by acting successfully in a way in the environment that requires a set of skills and requires maintaining your connection in these ways with the environment. So Gibson's insight was perceptual processes are temporary and especially extended processes that include the brain, the body, and the external environment. And when you think about it in this way, you can see that perception is very similar to dancing. I said there are two features of a dance that I'm going to say perception has, externality and mind dependence. Your dance is a real temporally and especially extended transient item in which you and your body and your partner participate, uh, perceiving also under the Gibsonian way of thinking has externality. It's a process that is temporally and especially extended and it's a transient item in which you, your body, and the world participate, the objects that you perceive. It is, in the same way, mind-dependent. Uh, the perceptual process that, it, that obtains enables you to actively participate in the world in this way. It depends partly in what is going on in your mind, not just what is going on in your body. There's, remember, the coordination routine that your brain has to figure out which one to use is something of a matter of what is going on in your brain. So just to return back to the analogy, you can say there is, you know, now I'm kind of uh, making the claim that Gibson makes a little bit moderate. Gibson thought that this is all perception is. I'm saying there is one way of perceptually connecting with the world. Call it core perception. Maybe there are other modes of perceptual connection with the world that are not like this, but call this way core perception. This core perception gives you really the world. That's where your connection with the world starts. Maybe you can create and base a ground, a representational system on that form of connection. But that basic form of connection is not a representational connection. I call that core perception. Core in core perception, the brain and the world together construct a dance. And we perceive the world by dancing with it. So to end the talk, with the problems that we talk about. How does this solve these problems? It solves the problem of perceptual knowledge 
by giving you a picture in which perception is a thing in which the world participates. If there is no world, there's not going to be a dance. Mind dependence, the dance that you're dancing partly depends on what is going on in your mind. It's not just a matter of how things are in the world, unlike what the realist thinks. And it also tells you, gives you multiplicity. There are as many ways to experience a property as there are ways to dance with it. A basketball player who is experiencing the flatness of the ground is experiencing it in a different way from a skateboarder that experiences the flatness of the ground. The feeling of flatness that we perceive is not the same in these two cases. It is the realist view that tells us that flatness is a property there, the quality of flatness I'm talking about, not physical flatness. And there is therefore one way to experience it collectively. But this view enables us to see how there could be multiple ways of experiencing something, although the experience is not something that is inside the head. Thank you. Have a sip of water, but okay. I don't need five minutes. Anyone needs to stretch for five minutes just for a few minutes. Or catch a baseball if you. <laughs>